everybody. Welcome again. And uh, this is more of an addendum video to the Renaissance. If you haven't watched the Renaissance video, I do think you should, because you can see the parallels of how they've operated to completely usurp the creativity of humankind for their agenda. So please go ahead and do that if you haven't already. And I hope you enjoy this one on the cave paintings. There's way more to it than meets the eye. I'm going to take you on a roller coaster ride of prehistoric art where the timely discoveries of cave art are put into question. So just bear with me until the end and then you decide for yourself. I make no claims other than to tell a story and I'm just asking questions and coming to my own conclusions. These are my opinions only. These are the facial reconstructions of Homo heidelbergensis a popular candidate as a common ancestor for modern humans, <laughs> excuse me if I laugh, Neanderthals and Denisovians. The discovery of cave paintings in Spain, the great conquistador country of the earth, marks the beginning of phase two of the Roman Catholic crusade to own this planet by way of using human creative currency through pseudo-religion using logos in the true sense of the word, reason and a plan, as we saw during the Renaissance. And I think I may have cracked their code. Hello, I will be your tour guide today, so hang on tight. So this is some of the cave art in dispute, so have a good look at it. And the first question is, why would you even care if this cave art is authentic or not? Because the truth revealed in our current existence shows us how we got to where we are today and the mess the world is in and how to fix it so that we can move forward unencumbered into the golden age. We are given clues, however, as to the deepest inner workings of what has been perpetrated against us, how gullible and foolish we have been in the hands of heretofore unseen entities that have corralled humanity into submission to the point now where our very humanity as a species is at stake. They had pulled it off before during the Renaissance using human creation currency to further their diabolical agenda, and they are doing it again using prehistoric cave art this time around, as it, like classical Greek and Roman art, claims to be ancient art. So the first ever cave art discovered in the whole wide world was in Spain and of course Altamira became known as Cantabria's prehistoric Sistine Chapel. So there's your first clue. So it all starts with this very first cave art discovery in the world in 1877 when this wealthy landowner, Don Marcelino Sanz de Sortuela, a Spanish jurist and who fancied himself as an amateur archaeologist, found this cave, Altamira, on his own land. And his daughter is actually the one who is said to have spotted the cave art, Maria Sanz de Sortuela who later married into the banking family Santander. So the Altamira Caves are Cantabria's prehistoric Sistine Chapel, and right there you have your clue. And Sotola also imagined himself as an amateur paleontologist, and he catalogued the findings and defended his cave finding for years from the disbelief of the scientific community. The people around him didn't believe these were true findings. And what happened was I went to France in my research and I found that I could not get the heck out of France. I looked at Australia and that cave art and I went to California and saw that. I went to Africa, to Somalia, and it all seemed really good and legit. Like, wow, you can trace back the tribes. These paintings are done in the light outside and at the, or at the cave entrance where there's lots of air and light. But something just seemed really wrong about the discoveries in Spain and France. And you're going to see why. And the reason is absolutely amazing. 
All throughout this presentation, I am going to be dropping little clues and hints, so look out for them as I'm speaking. Anyway, what happened was Sans de Sotola's research was publicized and it led to a bitter public controversy among experts, some of whom rejected the prehistoric origin of the paintings on the grounds that prehistoric human beings lacked sufficient ability for abstract thought, which is an interesting reason. And the controversy continued until 1902, by which time reports of similar findings of prehistoric paintings in the Franco-Cantabrian region had accumulated and the evidence could no longer be rejected. Altamira remains closed right now because it became part of a World Heritage Site in 1985 and they made a replica of it. But that's another story we'll go into in a little bit. But I want you to take note of that wild horse painting from the Altamira cave ceiling, which was copied by Abe Brule. And I want you to watch that name as we go forward. Anyway, 22 years later, one of the people present in 1880 Archaeologist Emil Kotelak did an absolute about face and, in a published Mia Culpa in the journal La Anthropologie in 1902, admitted that he had been dead wrong to dismiss the Altamira paintings. What's going to happen the very next year is they're going to find some more cave paintings. Anyway, Kotelak, in his revised opinion, said, Yes, they were indeed genuine and Paleolithic. And then him and Albe Brule went on to publish a big full-color book about cave paintings. The rest is history, so they say. And they also referred to the people who painted this cave art as the Stone Age Magdalenian peoples. Listen for that word again. Okay, now here is my smoking gun pick. You'll see it a lot throughout now. And take a look at that uh, area where the cave was found. This one was called El Castillo. And you see that pyramid-shaped hill they found it in. Very interesting. In Puente Viesco in Spain. And also the view from the top of the hill looks very suspect, like um, terraced pyramidical type terrain. And you'll see this is another theme going forward. You'll see strange megalithic items near where the caves are found, almost as if the caves are a distraction. But here we go. A priest, an artist, and a prince walk into a cave. What could possibly happen? This was in 1903, a year after the original cave findings were found to be real. It's actually 23 years after the Altamira discovery. Three, and this picture was taken right outside the El Castillo caves where more cave art from the Magdalenian Stone Age people was found. Cueva del Castillo was discovered in 1903 by Hermillo Alcalde del Rio. So he was one of the pioneers in the study of the earliest cave paintings in the province of Cantabria, formerly known as Santander province. So you'll note, please, the Jesuit priest wearing the Cossack on the far left, and that's Bruel, and we'll have much more about him later. Then we have the artist next to him, Louis Tenner. Then we have uh, Mr. Obermeyer, who is a Bavarian archaeologist, then we have Prince Albert on the far right, seated. So let's zoom in and take a closer look at these characters. Abbe Brul or Henri Brul, the French Catholic priest, would come to be known in the future as the prehistoric pope. Then Louis Tenner, the prince's personal artist, who is said to have traveled around the world with the prince. Hugo Obermeyer from Freiburg, Switzerland. Well, that's where he was born, but he was a German prehistorian who worked primarily in Bavaria, Austria, Spain, and France. And due to his interdisciplinary scientific background and his international activities, he is said to have shaped modern prehistoric research 
like hardly anyone else. That's a quote. And then, of course, on the far right, we've got Prince Albert I of Monaco, who financed the cave project. Okay, now we're going to zoom out to the big picture for a second here so that it will all come together in the end as to what's going on here behind the scenes. And in order to do that, we have to go to the Paris Exposition Universelle in 1878. And here we find Louis Tenere, the artist, present, making sketches at the Paris Expo, and that's where he met Prince Albert I of Monaco, Don Marcelino Sans de Sotola. Remember the guy that found the very first cave with cave art in it? He also attended the fair, and that's where he saw prehistoric artifacts on display. A year later, the Exposition Universelle, or World Fair opened where prehistoric artifacts were exhibited along with cave scenes of Neanderthals. Now, you have to ask yourself at this point, is this a coincidence? No, it's not. And this is a picture of the Palais du Trocadero above, which was specially built for the 1878 World's Fair around 1868. So it only took 10 years to build that magnificent building, which, of course, we know is from Tartaria and was absolutely co-opted and used for the World Fairs. And isn't it so ironic that it's all set against this backdrop of Tartaria that was far more technically advanced than anything new at the fair? Okay, so now we have to zoom in real close to the fair and see what they were exhibiting there, which is obviously... Uh, very distasteful, but it is all connected to the cave paintings, and you'll see how this all ties together in a little bit here. So this is a colonial ethnographic or indigenous village exhibition, and it just seemed these exhibits, as time went on, they just got worse and more ambitious until they ended up being almost like freak shows. And that young, beautiful man on the left there holding the monkey is an example of how far it went. His name was Ota Benga, and he was a pygmy Congolese man who was exhibited in the Bronx Zoo in New York in 1906, and he literally died in captivity like an animal. And the term human zoos was coined in the year 2000, and to me that most aptly describes these exhibits. And the focus for these indigenous people's exhibits always seems to be on their possessions, like their bowls and spoons and traditional artifacts and tools for how they survive their daily menial tasks. And there's never any information about their spiritual beliefs. And all this was juxtaposed against all the modern items featured at the expo to make them look like primitive savages and to make the new industrial world they were peddling, the colonialists and the robber barons were peddling all around them. It made them look fabulous by comparison. And first they were just sculpted exhibits, but soon they became live exhibits, as you just saw with Otto Benga. So by this time, the Paris Fair of 1878, Darwin was already a household name because his Origin of the Species had been published back in 1859. And it just so happened that his book was a bestseller. So as you can see, everything is falling nicely into place and the silly humans are buying all the evidence, hook, line and sinker. And it's very interesting that Thomas Henry Huxley was known at the time as Darwin's bulldog. He was pushing Darwin's theory and he happened to be the grandfather of Aldo Huxley who wrote Brave New World. So it's all in the family, and they're managing the human psyche together through generations. Meanwhile, the Jesuits were running around all over the earth trying to find skulls to match Darwin's theory. And Bruhl himself is said to have spent eight years of his life underground in caves, 
I guess hunting down the missing link, and then later Brühl and Teilhard de Chardin. Together they went to China and Peru, and that's where they found the famous Peking Man skull. So more than for any other reason, the cave discoveries obviously was to prove Darwin right so that we could feel as far from ascended beings as possible as far from that as we were from our ancestors 60,000 years ago, which is the date that they gave the El Castillo and the Altamira Caves. So here we see my theory of evolution. Uh, human plus Anunnaki equals humanarchy. And also I do believe as Homo sapiens sapiens we were much larger when there was more oxygen and food on the land and then after the flood then we obviously lived in a shortage of food and I think that's when we became smaller. And of course there may have been changes done to our DNA that we know nothing about. But as you can see by that picture of those guys moving that skull in the wheelbarrow, that is Homo sapiens sapiens, that skull. So that's my theory of evolution. All the other skulls are really different species, you know, like the Denisovian man. And then there was this Chinese skull found in a well, which absolutely proved that Darwin's theory did not fit the theory of evolution. And then there were the Nephilim, of course, the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. They came along. And uh, this is the bloodline that tried to take over the earth, still trying to take over the earth, if you ask me. They own and direct banking, pharmacia, religion, and history. And so they need us to be docile and non creative, keyword, if they are going to get away with it. They always use our creativity against us and to push their agenda forward with the visuals, the movies, the songs, the advertising, everything like that. And they are extremely clever at manipulating Homo sapiens. However, Creating the cave painting scenario wasn't the final goal. It was just a piece of a much larger agenda, as you shall see. Bam! It's 1940, right toward the beginning of the outbreak of the Second World War, and we have another huge discovery. And it's in color, just like TVs. And it's in a French cave this time. And it's the famous Lasso cave painting. The story goes about the discovery was that there was a, a local story about a secret tunnel that led to buried treasure. And these boys went searching for it. And then they found it. But it wasn't the treasure, it was the cave painting. And it was found by four boys and their dog. Their dog's name was apparently Robot. When this news quickly spread about the discovery, the schoolmaster turns out to be a local prehistorian, and he, however, suspected it was a ruse to trap him in the hole. But when he went cautiously down and saw the paintings, he immediately felt sure they were prehistoric and insisted that no one must be allowed to touch them and they must be guarded against vandalism. But there are many conflicting stories about the discovery, of course, as with everything I do with this, especially timelines and dates. They, they vary between 30,000 years. You'll read that a cave is 30,000 years old and then you'll read that it was 60,000. Just crazy the way they throw away these thousands of years they throw them around like candy so this time though there were no outright disputes just a few logistical questions that I had to go digging really really deep for because the most interesting thing about this is that there are no known deposits of that specific manganese oxide that's found at less so anywhere in the area surrounding the cave and the closest known source is 150 miles away in the central Pyrenees the mountain but word of the discovery reached who but Abe Bruel 
the eminent prehistorian who immediately vouched for the painting's authenticity. Isn't he always such Johnny on the spot to authentic cave paintings? But alas, the caves were closed to the public in 1963 due to human breath damage. Some sort of fungus had invaded the original cave. I call Lasso the Disney World of cave art. Never has such bold, clear, clean cave art of this artistic caliber and age been discovered. 30,000 plus years old, never has such ancient art been able to capture the moving essence of a creature before. This is the work of masters, not Neanderthals. Researchers surveyed depictions of four-footed animals throughout history and found that the representations of bulls and other animals on the walls of the prehistoric Lasso Cave were generally more anatomically correct than modern rendering. And they say that Paleolithic people living more than 10,000 years ago had a better artistic eye than modern painters, and at least when it came to watching how horses and other four-legged animals move. More about that later. Which cave art were they looking at? Lasso! And then the biggest discrepancy of all is the cave that was discovered in 1994. Now stay with me. I can assure you this story does come to a resounding head. And first we have to go and visit the caves that were discovered in 1953 because we need a very well-rounded tale for this all to hold up in the end. So bear in mind, this is the second time now these cave paintings have been disputed, if not the third. Although the exact caves are not mentioned in this New York Times article, they are in the same area as Lasso, but it's not the Lasso cave paintings that are in dispute here. The caves mentioned in this article were found in 1953 in probably the Villars Caves in the Villars area, which was said to have been occupied during the Lower Magdalenian period by Cro-Magnon hunter-gatherers. And this cave is part of the French commune of Villars in the North Dordogne Département. And there was a William Martin, who was a former president of the local speleologists club. Speleologists are the people that go around hunting and looking for caves. And this club of Perigeux said, Martin said, he spent three years exploring that particular cave. Eight to ten years ago in 1946, and there were no paintings on the wall then. Some drawings, Mr. Martin asserted, were made by a small boy who tagged along behind his party of explorers a decade ago, using a carbide lamp as a crayon. As to the new pictures now reported, said Mr. Martin, they are phonies put in by people since. Believe me, none of these paintings date back more than eight or ten years. The president of the club, Bernard Pierret, backed up Mr. Martin. So we have two people that are disputing this. And when you go to look them up, you can't find any of them. They have been disappeared. A fortnight ago, three archaeologists of France are agog over some drawings in a cave. Speleologists with excellent reputation announced gravely the discovery of drawings on the wall of a cave near Perigeux in southwestern France. They said the pictures were made at least 20,000 years ago by cavemen. There were paintings of mammoths and other prehistoric animals, including big two-horned rhinoceroses. A great discovery, the Poitiers Conference of Archaeologists was told. They paint them and then wait for the aging process to set in, just like Michelangelo would bury sculptures for a while to make them appear ancient. I am familiar with this trick from studying the Renaissance. And if you go back to my Renaissance videos, you'll see the evidence. And here comes Abbe Henri Brule again, the ranking specialist on prehistoric art. And he tells all the newspapers, I declare the figures perfectly authentic. 
None of the people debunking the cave findings are featured in Wikipedia or can be found online. Good luck finding Mr. M. Martin. Back to Lasso now for a minute. A replica of the Lasso Caves called Lasso 2 was built close by to the original caves, kindly for the public in 1983. Then Lasso 3 was built. I think that was a traveling lasso that went all over the world. Then Lasso 4, which now today draws 400,000 visitors a year. And it costs $63 million to build. I don't know if that's dollars or what currency that is. But today, all the caves are slowly closing to the public. And they're building replicas because these cave paintings... <laughs> have withstood 60,000 years of time, yet they began to crumble under the assault of human breath. After also having survived the most recent ice age, which peaked between 24,000 and 21,000 years ago, although in northern Europe, it still would have affected southern France during the melt. That's a lot of water. And these caves are not sealed off from water. So isn't it funny how the caves in other regions of the world have not been made into replicas? If there's such a big cash cow, wouldn't everybody be doing it? Wouldn't they all be getting ruined? And boom, all the problems with lighting and dating and hoaxes goes away. Poof, we've got a replica. We don't ever have to worry about any scrutiny ever again. So that's why they do the replicas. The original lasso caves were closed in 1963 and these synthetic reproductions called replicas can never be tested now for authenticity. Here we get to the psychology of lasso which is very very deep. First of all look at those uh, depictions of Stone Age people now in the bottom left hand corner of this visual. No longer Neanderthal, more Homo sapien looking, people you can relate to. Oh, that was us back then. Reminds me of the World Fairs all over again. But now they look like privileged whites and bejeweled cave people. Oh, and see the computers? Wow, it's interactive. By placing these replicas all over France in the areas of the Cathars or Gnostics and the places where Mary Magdalene lived out the rest of her life, they are harvesting this area in a ritualistic manner to drive home the theory of evolution over creation and natural design. So by 1955, it is said that each day around 1,200 people entered the original Lasso Cave. Then on the 18th of July, 1983, the first tourists entered Lasso 2, which was the first replica. And since then, close to 10 million people from all over the world have seen that first reproduction. And then today, 400,000 per year are herded through Lasso 4. It's an energy plasma sucking thing that keeps moving never endingly in this area. And then remember, Lasso 3 has been on a world tour, which started back in 2012 in Bordeaux. And its first stop was the Field Museum in Chicago. And then from there, it's been like all over the USA, various countries in Europe and the Far East, just like a little mini world fair. And this is how it is spoken of in general terms. It is said of Lasso, Lasso is one of the most important archaeological discoveries of the last century. In short, Lasso changed the way in which we think about the history of art. None of the caves known before 1940 had imagery anything like what we see in Lasso. There is a very good reason why Lasso has come to be called the Sistine Chapel of Prehistory. Remember, that's what they called Altamira when that was discovered. More significantly, however, it was the discovery of Lasso 
that changed ideas about the origins of art. Until the 1940s, it was widely thought that the origins of art lay in ancient Greece and Rome. With Lasso, artists and archaeologists were quick to realize that art had much deeper prehistoric origins. And what followed was a story of art that started in Lasso and ended in the Louvre. Today we rightly challenge this Eurocentric account of the history of art, but in the 40s it was Lasso that challenged a very narrow definition of what was considered art. So in reality, if we get back, jump out of the matrix, get back in reality, and let's state this. Lasso was turned into a massive psychological propaganda tool to take humanity literally back to the dark ages of living in a dark cave and as far from the path of ascendance as possible. And I just want to let you know that the real reason for the cave paintings is coming right up. We've got the whole backstory now, so just stay with me on this. It's going to be worth it. So here is the very first cave art replica of Altamira in Spain. And allow me the pleasure of reading this quote attached to it. A pearl of prehistoric Spain, in danger of disappearing. Can the 35,600-year-old art of Altamira cave be both witnessed and preserved? And they have one replica, which is in the Deutsches Museum in Munich, and the other is in Madrid, which was a gift from Germany to Spain in 1964. And sad to say, I think it looks like a pizza parlor where something went terribly wrong. We'll go more into the cave replicas in a minute. I'm just throwing this in here right now because it has to be addressed and it is a huge issue, you know. They said they had animal fat lamps to illuminate the space in the caves. Simple, just a shell or a hollow rock holding a piece of moss soaked in animal fat that burnt with a flame. But some of these caves are a mile long underground, and I really don't think that the lighting would be sufficient enough, and why would you want to wander all that way far in to a cave that has bears and goodness knows what else in it, pumas, whatever that leopard-like creature is that they paint on the walls in there. I don't know that it would be even safe. That's a big question mark for me. And by comparison, many of the cave paintings in Australia, Somalia, even in California, are painted right at the entrance where there's light and fresh air for the smoke to dissipate in. So that's a big question for me. So take a really close look at these images in front of you. There's a British cave painting discovery, but the paint never stayed on. They had to actually draw the outlines of the images so that you could actually see what it was. This is in Britain at Cresswell Crags. That one is 13,000 years old, said to be. And then you have the Mississippi cave art, which is much more realistically dated at 6,500 years ago. And if you look closely, you'll see it's very abstract and different. And none of this kind of art appears in the French caves. It's all very realistic animal representation. No strange beings or odd weird shapes. As you can see, there's a huge difference between the presentation of the art in the Lasso Chauvet type caves than there is in the recent discoveries of the United States and Britain. And yet the pieces that have been discovered in the United States and Britain are very, very much younger than the work done 50, 60,000 years before the art you see here in front of you. So that raises a lot of questions for me and it makes sense to question it too. So here you see the whole notion of subhumans creating cave art is still being used in the mainstream media today to demean humanity. And it just implies that you are as dumb as Stone Age people. And they're just laughing at us. And here's the LA Times. Case closed. Oldest known cave art proves Neanderthals were just as sophisticated as humans. 
So now they change the story again. We're not at first and then we are. We're superior to Neanderthals and now Neanderthals are just the same as us. Changing the narrative always to fit the latest picture that they would like you to grasp. And note they couldn't resist the horn's hand signal there. Just cannot resist their symbology. And that is the Minister of Culture of France, which is very interesting because Paris is really the de facto culture power of the world, and it even has its very own Egyptian obelisk to boot, just like the three independent powers that rule the world, D.C., the Vatican, and the Crown. And, as per usual, all the lies of the past are always brought forward to bolster the current political psyop of the time, here we have the cave art COVID mix, where major moments from modern history have been reimagined as ancient cave art, including the coronavirus pandemic, where the Black Lives Matter movement and Brexit was immortalized in Buckinghamshire's Hellfire Caves. That'll screw up some people in the future, I'm sure. So just as we had Raphael from the Renaissance, where his newfound cause of death was found to be an upper respiratory disease, just like COVID symptoms, rather than the syphilis he was originally diagnosed with. See how they go back and take these huge art movements and throw them into our current day socio-political situation to boost what they're saying. It's like it's backed up by art. That's how powerful art is. Something that really struck me too were all these hands everywhere. The hand symbology is all over the French and Australian cave art, but it is not a standard feature of other cave art around the world, such as the Chumash Caves in California. In Africa, you have the Lachshil Caves in Somalia. And also I saw some in Indonesia in the latest, oldest ever discovered caves in Indonesia. So that's something to look out for here because we know their symbology is always ever present and they speak to each other using it so that they know what's going on and we don't know what's going on. In fact, forget about just the caves. They have catalogued, staked and inventoried every beautiful place on earth as theirs under the guise of protecting it. Just as they surveil humans and go digging inside them right down to the nano level, so too have they surveilled this world right up to the macro level. They have their hand in everything. The Patrimonio Mundial insignia they're written around that circle basically means ownership of the commons. And of course it looks like a square within the circle. And the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which is a specialized agency of the United Nations, is aimed at promoting world peace and security through international cooperation in education, arts, sciences and culture, which you and I both know is just one big lie. And this Rex Mundi that it says Patrimono Mundial is written around that world heritage symbol. Rex Mundi traps the soul on earth. According to the Cathar faith, there's a good God called Rex Deus who made the heavens and the human soul. But there's also an evil God called Rex Mundi who entrapped that soul to suffer in the flesh of the human body on earth. Very interesting indeed. And you'll see how this connects together in a minute. They have full access to do what they will with these places by declaring them protected. A World Heritage Site is a landmark or area with legal protection by an international convention administered by the United Nations. Note the Roman Acropolis logo too. It's the Empire of Rome 2.0. More than 80% of these sites are located in Europe and Asia, and the income garnered is probably in the billions. Here is where some would say that my hypothesis that all the cave paintings in France 90% of them are fake, falls apart. Because Chauvet Caves were only discovered in 1994, long after the deaths of 
Louise Tenere. So you may just throw up your hands and say, oh, well, that can't be true now. But wait, isn't it funny that a rock slide blocked the cave entrance and it was only discovered in 1994? And wow, the rock slide happened 21,000 years ago. That's impossible. Oh no, they could have easily have blocked the cave in the winter time. That's why there were so many bears that were found. Hundreds of bear skeletons were found in the cave because they blocked it during the dead of winter. And then they let it age beautifully, just like Michelangelo did with his stupid sculptures. And then, oh my goodness, it was discovered in 1994. But anyway, they have a replica of it, of course, because this time they didn't even allow the breathing public humans to go into the cave in the first place because it would have damaged them. So they immediately made a replica. And voila, what do you have? You have a place that cannot be scrutinized or authenticated because it's a replica. And I'll just add to that that not all Paleolithic imagery done in black employed charcoal, by the way. And uh, there's a scientist, Genest, that notes that in Lasso, for instance, manganese oxide was used, which I believe was the same for this cave. So now Chauvet Cave is the second oldest known cave art in Europe. And we can clearly see evidence of perspective in this 30,000-year-old painting. And remember, perspective was said to have emerged during the Renaissance, one-point perspective. And there was never an official proclamation of a hoax. But in this case with Chauvet, it was inferred by other scholars of archaeology. And my favorite professor, Pettit, wrote a book called Against Chauvinism, Chauvetism, a critique of recent attempts to validate an early chronology for the art of Chauvet Cave. And the scientists inspecting the caves dated them at even older than Lesso, which is to be expected. You know, they were rendered 30,000 to 32,000 radiocarbon years ago. And conventional assumptions are that such sophisticated works did not appear until 15,000 years later. And there was a small but persistent group who continue to question the age of the paintings, saying that Chauvet is the most problematical dated cave art site. This is Paul Pettit. He said that Chauvet drawings are simply too magnificent for their time, that the cave paintings can be no older than the global flood, which occurred only around 4,500 years ago. And in fact, are likely to be much younger than that. So he may as well be saying they are a hoax. But he might lose his position, as happened with Cartel Hack. Remember him? How he changed his mind later? And all the ages and the dates differ from cave to cave. They contradict one another. All are claimed as the oldest until another cave is found. You know, I've seen Altamira dated at 30,000 years and 65,000 years, so which one is it? A plausible time for the emergence of symbol in proto-language is estimated to be only 850 to 2,200 years ago. And this is a scientist named Erki Luke. And Symbol and Its Evolution was the name of this book that he wrote, which was published in 2018. And in this paper, he investigates the problem of tracing the emergence of symbolism in the Homo lineage. He says that they define the symbol via the notions of arbitrary and spatio-temporally displaced reference and analyze the earliest manifestations of different forms of symbolism, color, figurative abstract in the form of codes, other signs, and ritual burials and proto-language. So besides symbols themselves, diverse physical and behavioral traits that might constitute a cir circumstantial evidence for symbolism is scrutinized by Eric Luke. And he further goes on to say that when they draw on the archaeological and fossil evidence, a plausible time for the emergence of symbol in proto-language 
is, as I said, estimated to be 850 to 2,200 years ago. So another thing they're doing is also trying to write this art off as inspired and created under shamanic influences, but they're not because I've seen the art in the caves that is created under shamanic influences and it's not as representational. And then in 1998, Jean Klotz headed the research team that appraised Klotz Chauvet this extensive Paleolithic cave in the Ardèche Valley. In 1998, Jean Clot headed a research team that appraised Grotte Chauvet, and it was said to obviously rival those at Les so in terms of number, diversity, originality, beauty, and state of conservation. Jean Clot in 1994, joined with a South African anthropologist, David Lewis Williams, to study prehistoric art in light of known neuropsychological phenomena associated with shamanic trances. And together they concluded that there is a strong argument for believing that much of prehistoric art was in fact produced in the context of shamanic practices. Then, in 1992, Dr. Jean Clot was named General Inspector for Archaeology at the French Ministry of Culture. And in 1993, he was appointed Scientific Advisor. And then what happened in 1994? whoop de doo We found Chauvet Caves. I find it most curious that right outside the discovery of the Chauvet Caves, is this huge archway which they claim the river carved a hole in this rock we have evidence here of a former truly ancient civilization right on the doorstep of the painted caves just like we did at el castillo with that pyramid and for me this is another big look over there moment for the books but pontu arc is an even bigger lie because, they, as they say, the river eroded the bridge. Previous research has demonstrated human use of the cave in two phases. During the Aurignacian, which was 37,000 to 33,500 years ago, and the Gravesian from 31,000 to 28,000 years ago. The Aurignacians are part of the wave of anatomically modern humans thought to have spread from Africa through the Near East into Paleolithic Europe and became known as European Early Modern Humans or Cro-Magnons. This wave of anatomically modern humans includes fossils of the Armarian, Bohunitian, Aurignacian, Gravesian, Solutrian and Magdalenian cultures. So what we're looking at is the classification of eras of our apehood that were devised by none other than Brühl himself and the Roman Catholic Church. And very interesting that they chose the word Magdalenian to name an entire culture, which I believe was actually during the time when Mary was walking in France and teaching with the Cathars. Very interesting. So going back to dating, just let me be clear here. I don't think that Mary Magdalene and her followers and the Cathars were all running around during Cro-Magnon times. What I'm saying is that they are using this word Magdalenian to embed a subconscious image in your mind because they know that Mary Magdalene was in France and the other reason I'm bringing this up is because Fomenko believed that Christ walked the earth during the 1100s. And of course, Anatoly Fomenko is the Russian scientist who revised the rewritten history that the Roman Catholics devised during the Renaissance. And I'm sure these uh, cabal, skull and bones type creatures would want to subliminally embed that in your mind that Mary Magdalene and the teachings of Christ were from prehistoric times where man knew nothing and was not evolved when man really was evolved and it wasn't that long ago in time. Let's look at the cave area that we've just discovered as far as dates go and I don't trust radiocarbon dating one little 
dot. Very similar traits between the cave art, even though there is a 15,000 to 30,000 year time span between Chauvet and the other two, Lasso and Altamira and even Castillo, if you think about it. And the dates give themselves literally tens of thousands of years of leeway. And the dates cannot be trusted or pinned down. And they keep changing. And the dates are telling us many things, but of which the main thing is that nothing much changes in a 15,000 year time span. Just imagine how many things could change in 15,000 years. It was as if time stood still for radiocarbon dating. And I can see how the Ice Age would slow things down a bit, but really they have no idea of the true date. People are still living in caves and drawing with charcoal and pigments from 150 miles away, 15,000 years apart from their living existence. And at Lasso, there are no manganese oxide deposits, as I've said before, of the specific type found at Lasso, anywhere in the area surrounding the cave. The fact that the most advanced advanced artwork by far is Chauvet, the most recently found caves, tells us that we were going backwards and that humanity was devolving when the skulls from these periods are showing us that we are evolving from apes to humans. It's all madness. In Lasso, the age of the paintings is now usually estimated at around 17,000 years, which is early Magdalenian, so now they've lobbed off like 14,000 years off the day. And in Chauvet, there's 13 different species, including some rarely or never found species in other Ice Age paintings. And also there was canvas prep. The walls were actually scraped clear of debris and concretion, leaving a nice smooth and noticeably lighter area upon which the artists work. And also in this cave, the animals are actually interacting with each other. Some of the art dated is 27,000 to 26,000 BP, and the earliest sample from Zone 10 dates to 32,900 plus minus 490 before present. So this makes the art superior to the art dated 15,000 years later. I feel that the Chauvet cave paintings are most suspect even to the untrained eye. They look great for 30,000 years old. If you leave them alone long enough, cave drippings are going to flow over them to make them look old, of course. And very interesting that Picasso went to visit the Chauvet caves and after viewing the Paleolithic bull paintings, he said... After Chauvet, all is decadent. I think he knew. And then remember, he went on to perpetuate the cave bull art in the Guernica with, of course, all its bullish symbology. So let's go back to Louis Tenere, born in 1861, died in 1942. And remember, the prince uh, adored him and he became the prince's consort. Prince Albert I of Monaco, remember they met at the Universal Exposition World Fair in Paris in 1900. And Prince Albert valued Tenere's abilities as a painter and a reporter. So he asked Louis Tenere to illustrate the third edition of his travel memoir, La Carrière du Navigateur, The Career of a Navigator. And from 1904 onwards, Tenere took part in the Prince's oceanographic expeditions and was responsible for reporting on them both at sea and on land. And this proved to be a great alibi for him because where was Louis Tenere? Oh, he was out sailing the oceans wide. And he was also the artist tagging along with Henri Brill, the prehistoric pope, who had all the sketches of cave paintings from around the world. So nice reference. Louis Tenet had also made posters and drawings of the Paris World Fairs and was said to have specialised in painting animals. Louis Tenet died at the age of 82, two years after Lasso was discovered, and he lived a few hours' drive away in Grosrouve. They could have painted the caves much earlier to age them, as I've said before, like Michelangelo with his forged sculptures, who would bury them and then take them out of the earth as aged ancient sculptures, and he could also have overseen work in the caves. 
144 years after El Castillo, France held a commemorative expo for him and Prince Albert called The Prince and the Painter, sponsored by, guess who, UNESCO. Why would UNESCO be sponsoring a Louis Tenere Expo all those years later? One of the most interesting findings about the Chauvet Caves was done by Gilles Tosello, University of Toulouse, who said that it's likely that just one artist was responsible for the art done. He said that the entire composition is very homogenous and has a very strong coherence. He says the horse's heads are rendered even more vivid because the artist used a tool to etch the cave wall around their muzzles, a la bas relief. And he says by meticulous analysis of the supposition of charcoal lines, as well as slight thickenings at the beginning and the end of each stroke, Art experts have been able to reconstruct the order and the direction in which each line was drawn. The rhinos were drawn first, beginning with the horns and muzzles, then the front legs and bellies, then the rest of the bodies, then the aurochs are left, working from bottom to top, and finally the horses, progressively from the top. The art experts say that whoever drew the panel deliberately reserved a space in the centre for the four horses, whose heads and necks are slightly superimposed over the backs of the cattle and arranged in a tight diagonal orientation. You would think a homo sapien would find it quite easy to mimic a Neanderthal. You would be dead wrong. Was Tenere too talented for the job, even though he died 81 years ago taking his little secret to the grave? I believe Lasso and Chauvet were painted and thus pre-aged long before they were discovered. Make no mistake, Louis Tenere was a very talented artist. He was drawing at the World Fairs, he made posters for the World Fairs, and he even drew illustrations in books about savages. Because remember, they were painting this ugly picture of indigenous peoples in order to rid the world of them. Tenere could very easily have painted the three main caves all at the same time, or one after the other, Altamira, Lasso, and Chauvet, maybe even Castel El Castillo. So this is why Professor Pettit said that the Chauvet drawings are simply too magnificent for their time. And as I have said, researchers say Paleolithic people who lived more than 10,000 years ago had a better artistic eye than modern painters. Now here we get down to the real nitty-gritty of what it means to dissect this art and find out the truth about it. And believe me, I have dug very deep because I know my claims are great and they can easily be laughed at and quashed. So I have gone into every detail I possibly can to prove that this was not the work of prehistoric man. So when it comes to watching how horses and other four-legged animals move, you have to take a really close look at that because artists tend to mess up depictions of four-legged animals because of the gait and there was a test done where 73.3 percent of the time the researchers calculated that this was done incorrectly the gait of the animal art produced after prehistory showed more errors than chance would predict in fact 83.5 percent of depictions from this time period are wrong four-legged animals walk by moving their legs in the same sequence First the left hind foot hits the ground, then the left front foot, followed by the right hind foot, and finally the right front foot. So only the speed at which four-legged animals complete this sequence differs. That's it. There's also a biological physicist whose name is Gabor Horvath, a researcher at Jotvas University in Hungary, and he found that 63.6% of the animals depicted in anatomy textbooks were drawn in impossible gates. And Louis Tenere was an expert at drawing animals. And when you take a close look at his work, he gets the gait correct. The way that the animal moves is correct in every animal that he draws or paints. And here is where I say, well, it may have been the priest, Henri Brule, because he too was an artist. 
Well, maybe he could have helped, but I think he gave direction, and I think it would have been too obvious if he had done the paintings in the caves. So what was their true agenda? Well, we know that Brule was a Catholic priest and Tenere the artist. Obermeyer was known as the man who shaped modern prehistoric research like hardly anyone else, and Prince Albert funded these cave projects. But it's the priest that seems the most intriguing, because Abbe Henri Brule is the dominant figure in the history of cave art interpretation. He became interested in the art of the caves in 1900 at the age of 23, and only one one year later had already discovered two previously unknown sites. Voila! He was appointed Professor of Archaeology at the Collège de France in 1929 and he was immediately notified when the cave at Lasseau was discovered in 1940 and then soon he became the world's foremost authority concerning cave art. Like Tenet, as I said, he was also an artist, but after getting his baccalaureate, Brule entered the Issy Le Molinus Seminary. Uh, interestingly, the origin of the name is arising from the temple of the Egyptian goddess Isis, which is located at 6.6 .6 kilometers from Notre Dame Cathedral, all these numbers. And today this seminary is called the Seminary of St. Sulpice, a society of the priests. So it is here where Brule met masters with whom he would have discussions during which the problems of the creation and evolution of the human species were often discussed. I don't think it was a discussion, I think it was a plan. So then Brule went on to establish an intellectual affinity with his science teacher Father J. Boissigny, a passionate geologist who initiated classification methods for concocting the periods of man. That's where the word Magdalenian came from, and provided works familiarizing Brule with the prehistoric. They had as teachers Jean Joubert, author of a treaty entitled Origins. They were going back to Darwin-esque type thinking. Origins was an apologetic questioning on the reports of science and religion. So in 1908, the brothers Amadi and Jean Boissonny found the most complete Neanderthal skeleton to date in a small cave near La Pachelle aux Saints in France. So this is how Brule, the young seminarian, while answering to his religious vocation, entered the mysteries of a science being newly explored. Take away the word explored and insert invented. In 1911, Abbe Brule was appointed Professor of Prehistoric Ethnography at the Institute of Human Paleontology. Brule never even practiced as a priest. He was merely a foot soldier for the Catholic Church to promote the inferiority of the human species through fabricated research, verified by scholars of the very institutions created by the Church, such as the Sorbonne in France, the Seminary of St. Sulpice, and many others worldwide. Prehistory was dreamed up as a legitimate academic subject, by the Catholic Church. And that's where it all started, in France, at Altamira. So how did man survive 60,000 years ago? With the cave paintings, newly discovered, the evidence is supplied, which tells us, falsely or truly, we don't really know, that covers an abundance of both food and clothing needs. It's all painted on the walls, how they survived. Then again, remember Fomenko's new chronology, which condenses human civilization and other reviews of our true history, also put our timeline back to only 6,500 years. So by arguing the events of civilizations were artificially placed further back in time, Fomenko's chronology was conducted on 15 chronological tables and 228 fundamental primary sources which covered all of the basic events of world history between 4000 BC and 1800 AD. It seems the great manipulators of time itself never stop bending time, bending fact, bending our minds, bending everything, bending, twisting, 
and distorting so that we might never know our true origin and believe ourselves to be inferior human beings, never capable of ascending without the aid of the Roman Catholic Church. Now we come full circle. One of the many reasons so many caves were discovered back to back is because they may have been looking for the Holy Grail. That Catholic priest often stated that he'd spent eight years worth of being underground during his lifetime. So who knows, maybe he was really looking for the Holy Grail. All the great prehistorians arose within the Catholic religion. So there is no doubt in my mind that Abbe Brühl had much to do with the findings of paintings in many of the caves. Here we see him at the entrance of the Grotte de la Vache near Gargas as late as 1958. He's with Dr. Sali, who did a lot of research at the Grotte de Gargas, so there is no doubt that Brule was there too, and he's still at it after 55 years, because until the arrival of Charles Darwin with the publication in 1859, of The Origin of Species, and later The Descent of Man in 1871, all fitting very nicely into the prehistoric timeline invention. So what about all the other caves? Tanea couldn't have possibly painted them all. That's true. There are 25 art caves in the area listed as UNESCO sites, but I'm not saying that all the cave art is fake, because some may be real. People lived a long time ago and went inside and made drawings and stuff on the walls. Perfectly natural. But it's the dating that I have a problem with. Because, for example, at the Croto de Brabahau, there's an interesting set of 18 fine line engravings, but they need a light box and diagrams so that you can even make them out. But their existence does lend authenticity to the fake caves, and the engravings are thought to be 14,000 years old, which is 15,000 years newer than Lasso, which makes them inferior, yet dated much later, and they should be in much better condition. And all the caves are not the great art galleries that Altamira, Lasso, Chauvet are. For example, Resso Clastre is known for its footprints and two small charcoal drawings, but those two charcoal drawings look like maybe Tene ran in and did a couple of sketches and ran back out, just to back up their drawings to amplify the fake findings in the other caves, perhaps. It is said that Resse Clastre's cave site was the first visited in 1860. 64, but it is not stated that art was there when it was found, which was 13 years before Altamira, which was, as we know, the very first cave art discovery in the world. Nothing makes sense in cave land. And the drawings in there remind me of the lines used in Lasso and Chauvet, actually. So I think Tenere ran in there real quick to plant evidence to back up the greats. Anyway, once again, we're seeing inaccuracies all over the place, just as we did when we looked closely at the Renaissance art period. And if you look at the lines on that sketch in Rosso Clastre, you can see that the lines are confident and quick movement. They show the movement of a seasoned artist. It's not laboured at all and nothing at all like Grotto d'Amasse with the light box. And then in the Gargas caves, we see the hand motif once again, prominent, and their symbol of we are here, but it's a secret. So I have no problem with the dating of artefacts, though. I mean, they're probably way older than they say they are, but They're made and they're lying around. I have a problem with the paint used to make the drawings. I just can't see how it lasted 30,000 or 60,000 years and then suddenly fades in a few years after the caves are open. And La Roque de Fond de Gaume was discovered in 1901, which is 34 years after Altamira. And experts are calling this cave one of the six giants of Paleolithic art. And I found proof that the archaeologist Henri Brühl had visited the site early on and made drawings 
from the work that was in there. Hmm, tongue in cheek. Uh, but Grotto de Merveil looks like a normal find. It's uh, very, it doesn't look like a Disney production. It looks like maybe somebody was experimenting with some charcoal on the wall. So now we're going to go into the evidence of the real reason for establishing the fake art caves. This area is the premier battleground of good and evil in the world as far as I can see. Remember Altamira in Spain was the very first cave discovered in the world in this area and then after that the, the discoveries moved to France. So make no mistake this area was an old battleground area of great significance to the Catholic Church. And as we know, Mary Magdalene was sent to have spent her last days in a cave in France. Pilgrimages to the south of France to St. Mary Magdalene's cave still abound today, although I don't think that was her cave, by the way. But Mary Magdalene was also known to be in Spain near Santander. And we all know that Santander was one of the biggest banks in the world, the 16th largest, in fact. And the story goes that Mary cured many people and her teachings made her convent very wealthy from donation. And it became so wealthy that a church was built in her name with the money from the donation. And there's an old tale about Mary where the Queen of Spain and her husband came to Mary to ask that she pray for their son. So there's a connection with royalty and Santander Bank, which is questionable here. And again, let's go back to Fomenko's revised chronology about Jesus being incarnated on earth in the 11th century, which would place Mary's influence and teachings much nearer to the period of the 1800s than we think it was, only 800 years prior rather than back into ancient unreachable history. And Mary's presence and that of the Cathars was still palpable. And the energy, that spiritual energy, was not yet removed from the bones of the land because it lasted 800 years after the Inquisition at the Albigensian Crusade, which was in 1209 to 1229, which was, and it was Pope Innocent III that made that phrase, kill them all, famous. Kill them all. This neo-Gnostic dualism that saw clearly that the root of the problem was good against evil, satanic versus godly, just as it is today. Cathar nobles in the Languedoc owned vast tracts of extremely valuable land, which obviously further incited the wrath of the Catholic Church. And during the 12th and 13th centuries, more than half a million men, women and children in this area were massacred which resulted in the eradication of an entire civilization in the area broadly bordered by the Mediterranean Sea, the Pyrenees and the Garonne, Tarn and Rhone rivers known as the Languedoc. Christ was said to be born in 6 BC as per Scaliger's time, which was the Roman Catholic's revised timeline that they made during the Renaissance period. It was done under the Medici family. And in the revised Fomenko timeline, Mary may have been Cathari or Gnostic, as her teachings seem to very much align with the Gnostic teachings. And the Cathar priests lived simply. They had no possessions. They imposed no taxes or penalties. And they regarded men and women as equals. Aspects of the faith which appealed to many at the time who were disillusioned with the church. And this is everything that the church was against and everything they were about to establish as far as a world deeply entrenched in materialism which was just about to come along with the great industrial revolution. All of the caves are found in the exact area that Mary Magdalene was preaching and she preached what Jesus told her alone and not the apostles. The Gospel of Mary is a non-canonical text discovered in 1896 in a 5th century papyrus codex written in Sahidic Coptic, not relating to, part of, or sanctioned by a canon, these canons of the Roman Catholic Church. Mary's Gnostic teachings went against the Roman Catholic Church. 
She shared highly advanced spiritual messages beyond the comprehension of the apostles that only she really could understand from her teachings from Christ. And she began to teach these teachings in France in this very area. So the Catholic Church needed to counter her teachings using Darwin's evolution of the species material and their little cave paintings rather than letting humans ever know that they were direct descendants of God, which is what Mary taught. So I believe these caves may even have been used for ritualistic purposes to taint the ether of all the spiritual and beautiful wealth of Christ consciousness that had permeated the land through the Cathars and Mary Magdalene's teachings. The Catholic Church wanted the energy of the Mother Mary who had given birth to the Son of God and Mary Magdalene with her loving energy signature of the one living woman on earth who had loved Christ. They wanted it dissolved forever from the face of the earth more than anyone else. So the Roman Catholic Church and their henchman Abbe Henri Bruhl the Cossack-wearing Jesuit, nicknamed the prehistoric Pope, sought to do just that. By making us believe that we came from apes and not God, it was Henry Bruhl and associates who undertook this lifelong goal on behalf of the Catholic Church. They had tolerated the deification of Mary during the Renaissance, but now they had their chance through mass indoctrination to destroy her legacy once and for all through black magic and academentia-approved science in the very place she was said to have spent the rest of her days, southern France. So how did they do it? By taking charge of the prehistoric sites, by taking charge of the narrative of the evolution of man, the cave art of France is an energy harvesting ritual to keep humanity from ascending. Millions of people a year go through all the fake cave exhibits scattered across France. Across the sea in southern France a myth arose. Legend says that a boat with no sails and no oars landed on the shores of Provence. Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, along with Martha, Lazarus, and an Egyptian servant named Sarah, are said to have landed in St. Marie de la Mar, now named for the arrival of the Holy Marys from the sea. The story goes that each settled in a different area of France, that Mary Magdalene herself started a church and retired to live out her days in a grotto on the high hill of St. Balm. So St. Maxime, La saint Bom Basilica in France, has been the designated church for Mary and her death and a place where they encased her skull in gold. I mean, I've never seen anything more obviously tainted with the fingerprints of the Roman Catholic Church than this gaudy ensemble. And that's where they say she is now, but I don't think she's there and... Another possibility is the Santander Cathedral in Spain because she was there and she was very wealthy and that's where that bank is. But I believe it to be quite possible that the Abri de Madeleine is the true site of Mary Magdalene because that awful gold-adorned ostentatious Mary presented as the real Mary at St. Maximum La St. Bon Basilica is a decoy and presented as a false idol with Roman Catholic fingerprints all over it. Mary was a deeply spiritual being and she would be laughing at this effigy of herself. So this, the reason why I'm saying it's it may be at the Abri de la Madeleine is because there was confusion about the sex of the Magdalenian skeleton discovery that was found there because it was initially reported to be a male, then incorrectly found to be a girl, and now acknowledged as a woman, with evidence of wear and tear in the vertebral column. So if this is her skeleton, it, there's a possibility now, but not from the earliest findings. So the dates of the skeleton are all over the map too, of course, you know, anywhere from 12 to 21,000 years ago. 
and somebody treated the bones with ambroid, which is a cellulose nitrate-based cement that contaminated Magdalenian girl with modern radiocarbon, which made her seem too young when it was first dated. And they needed to date her really old because they wanted her far from Mary Magdalene's real life on Earth as possible. We know that. And the skeleton is also thought to have been buried deliberately, which is an interesting aspect of prehistoric behavior because they weren't supposed to bury their dead or something. I guess they just left people lying around to decay. We're back in the prehistoric days. And another interesting thing was that a large stone block was found over her head and feet, which hmm, could be the Holy Grail maybe. As well, that she was found lying on her left side with her arms and legs flexed. But yet, in 1916, the skeleton was sent to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and it was smuggled out of France with forged paperwork that declared it to be the bones of a dead U.S. soldier. So why is that? The Field Museum of Chicago then acquired the Magdalenian girl in 1926 and Henry Field himself displayed her not as how she was found in a fetal position but on her back. This has connotations. Remember Mary Magdalene the whore? So why was this skeleton in particular hailed as one of the most significant acquisitions the museum ever made, with tens of thousands flocking to see it on its first day? Then a replica of that skeleton was placed in the Abri Coblanc shelter where it was found originally, which is very interesting because that site was called the handkerchief site, and then there's another whole connotation about the handkerchief and what it means in Othello, the woman who cheated, the whore, the whole, all those connotations come back into play. And Magdalene is not a surname, but it is identified as the place where Mary came from, Magdala, which was originally a city in Galilee, Palestine. Why wouldn't this place be named for Mary Magdalene too? Because that's what it is. It's called Abri de la Madeleine, which is Magdalene. The Roman Catholic Church had nothing but disdain for Mary Magdalene and painted her as a whore, just as Skull and Bones owns the famous Geronimo skull. It would not surprise me if they owned the true skeletal remains of Mary Magdalene in order to do their rituals against her phenomenal Christ consciousness energies, especially in this area, in the land of the Cathars. This skeleton of the Magdalenian woman emerged from the ground into a colonial, intellectual and socio-political context obsessed with time. This is the archaeological site that was called Handkerchief. Here we have a reconstruction of the skull found at Magdalene Shelter, which now graces the new display at Lasso. The ritual is complete. The likeness of Mary Magdalene in effigy as an ignorant Stone Ager now holds a prominent place in the Lasso replica caves. Brule's dream is complete. Interestingly, when the cave painting mania entered the fray, it was right about the time that the Gospel of Mary was found by Grenfell and Hunt, and this was sometime between 1897 and 1906, but it was only published in 1983. So there's a very good chance that Brule knew about them and had read them and was acting to quell what he knew would come as a renewed interest in the Gospels and Mary and the real Christ consciousness. As I have said, I do believe that Mary was connected to the Cathars. And if we remove the thousand years added by Scaligeri and take Fomenko's calculations into consideration, then it would make Mary alive during the time of the Cathars. The 11th century to be exact... So I'll just give you a couple of examples from these Gnostic writings of Mary, Gospel of Mary of Magdala. Peter said, Did Christ really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Number 38 reads, 
Do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you, and do not give a law like the lawgiver, lest you be constrained by it. So the Catholic Church didn't want these Gospels revived, as they represented everything that the Church despised, women and sovereignty for humanity. They would rather have humanity believe that man made God. The Church had other plans for humanity. Interest would be legalized outright during the new age of materialism that the world fairs were heralding in throughout Europe and America. The organization of the 1917 code followed the divisions, personae res action, of the ancient Roman jurists Gaius and Justinian. Pope Benedict XV promulgated the 1917 code, and the teachings of Mary Magdalene were in direct opposition to the 1917 code because this code allowed for the acceleration of disparity and the defilement of the earth. They had no church buildings or property, these Cathars, and the Cathar church demanded no tithes of its members, and they also educated their own children. The Cathar church, in comparison to the corrupt practices of the Catholic church, was an honest and dedicated movement that rejected the trappings of wealth, lust, and power. Therefore, they were a threat to the Catholic Church. After attempting to sway Cathar followers away, Pope Innocent II, who sponsored a crusade to put down the heretic faith in 1209, during this campaign to put down these heretic Cathars, which lasted for decades, they left a palpable energy signature on the French countryside and on March the 16th, 1944, the 700th anniversary of the fall of Montségur, a Nazi plane carrying Alfred Rosenberg flew over the ruins of the castle that the Cathars had fled from and flew over it in a swastika pattern, which I'm sure this had something to do with their rituals and possibly with the Holy Grail because we know that Hitler himself and the Vril were obsessed with anything esoteric and they saw them as a threat to their existence because their beliefs were the antithesis of fascism. And it also proves that those Nazis were very interested in the area and the whole Mary Magdalene story and the Cathars, and especially the threat of the Christ consciousness to what they had planned for the world going forward. Okay, now I'm going to throw social Darwinism into the mix, which is Darwinism 2.0, which emerged in the 1870s, 20 years after Darwin was published, and right when the prehistoric caves were being discovered and made sensational, and the human zoos were up and running worldwide. Social Darwinism refers to theories and societal practices that apply biological concepts of natural selection and survival of the fittest to sociology, economics, and politics, thereby giving credence to the greed of the robber barons of the time. Social Darwinism holds that the strong see their wealth and power increase while the weak see their wealth and power decrease. Social Darwinist definitions reward strength and punish weakness. Competition between individuals in laissez-faire capitalism was stressed. Social Darwinism made the struggle between national or racial groups acceptable, thereby supporting eugenics, racism, imperialism, and fascism. So tying it all together now, we need to go back to Mary for a second and the Romans, because it was the Romans who had tried to destroy the Christ consciousness by crucifying Christ, but it was Mary Magdalene that defied this belief and taught that the Christ consciousness did not die with the individual death of Yeshua. She walked the very places in France and Spain that these caves were discovered, as did the very mother of Christ, the bloodline of prime creator source. Together they embedded the true teachings of the Christ consciousness in the south of France. Among several schools of Gnostic Christianity, Mary plays an essential role in the revelation of the gospel. She's a powerful holy woman, 
beloved wife of Jesus and a Christed woman who is co-equal with Jesus in the Christ revelation, she taught that it is no longer necessary for the embodiment of Christ to be in the form of an individual human. And the Roman Catholic Church knows humanity's growth and evolution toward ascension is inevitable, and it was their mission to drive a further stake into the heart of the Christ consciousness in every way possible. One of these ways was to promote Darwin's theory of evolution and to provide false evidence that humans were active 30 to 60,000 years ago as near ape-like entities busy painting caves. Because humanity's ascension is their greatest threat, it befell Bruhl and company to defile human consciousness to believe that we had already come such a long way, having evolved from apes. And it was now our good fortune to live in a new industrial age, heralding in the idolatry of the material over the spiritual, the desire for wealth now being the greatest desire over the desire to evolve spiritually. With the blessings of the Roman Catholic Church to impoverish humanity, they were well on their way to supreme control. Thus began the usurpation of humanity's creation currency to perpetuate the industrialized world using human creativity. Prior to this time, Europe, and especially the south of France, had been steeped in a new Magdalenian spirituality that embraced women and her divinity. Catharism had also emerged in the Languedoc region of southern France in the 11th century. Southern France had become a rich and meaningful spiritual realm that was about to be purged by the Roman Catholic Inquisitions, and this ruthless bureaucracy had survived into the 19th century. They had purged the Cathars and the Knights Templars by now, and the Roman Catholic Church needed a plan to keep it that way. Because to the Cathars, the material world was intrinsically evil, fashioned by the devil. The heavenly realm of the true God existed in spirit only according to their beliefs. And Catharism was also an esoteric religion that did not fit the future that was being brewed up by the Roman Catholic Church to be implemented by their Jesuit soldiers. The melding of Darwinism, social Darwinism and industrialism with the discovery of the cave art was the perfect recipe to set the tempo for the future to their advantage. It was a hat trick. They coerced humanity to focus back in time beyond the Cathars and the Inquisitions, way back to the cavemen. It was not a coincidence that in 1871, five years before the first cave art discovery, that Charles Darwin published The Descent of Man. This work was met with much contradiction since it opposed the biblical Genesis experience. It also focused on issues and observations of evidence of such descent the development of man from a lower species, a comparison of the mental powers of man and lower animals, intellect and moral developments, genealogy and man's diverse races. It was a work which predicted that the origin of man would be found in Africa, hence the displays at the world fairs of people, especially from Africa, being displayed in human zoos. The Roman Catholic Church sought to bypass the sordid memories of the Inquisitions, the memories of the Gnostics and Mary Magdalene in France, and highlight the cave paintings as a reference point to launch their new materialistic industrial world. The First World War was right around the corner, 1914 to November 1918. Indeed, the Industrial Revolution itself may have even been pre-planned in order to facilitate the manufacture of arms for the First and Second World Wars. I call this time the Great Belittling and the Bedazzling. They belittled us by telling us we came from apes and we painted in the caves, and then they bedazzled us with the world fairs to make them seem greater than anything else on the planet, the most superior beings that ever existed. And they had the Roman Catholic Church to back them up and to legalize usury. Phylum 
reptilia psychosis at its finest. They went to next level self-elevation by harvesting the power of the energy from the cathedrals and using them to further harvest the energy of humanity. And the caves themselves spawned a multi-million dollar business from inviting humans to pay and see replicas of their prehistoric antics. With The Descent of Man now published, 1871 marked the beginning of the battle for the Catholic Church's great psychological attempt to curtail the ascension of man by destroying every last remnant of the Christ consciousness from living memory. In reality, the great discoveries of the cave paintings was a psyop to get humanity to embrace progress as the Industrial Revolution was really the stepping stone for the First World War. Child labor emerged where innocents now became harvested as slaves. The Industrial Revolution also heralded in the age of chemicals. The advances in chemical manufacturing during the first Industrial Revolution were a crucial part of the overall advancement of industry, which laid the foundation for the chemical manufacturing industry that exists today, the very same chemical manufacturing industry that is killing everybody. And it was also a byproduct of the expanding chemical industry that became pharmacia as we know it today. So it was that Gnostic organic versus synthetic satanic came to be. The Cathars had embodied the truth in their religion. It wasn't just another religion. They knew about the great duality. They recognized their enemy and they named their enemy and their enemy was guilty. So the enemy destroyed them. They, the Cathars, were martyrs for humanity and we failed to heed their call. Even the discovery of their bones laid to waste in the huge cave they had sought refuge in below the castle failed to rouse us into what was really going on and the message that they were trying to tell us. We allowed the age of materialism and our own self-poisoning to flood into the gates of the future so fast because we were so bedazzled and so belittled. Just as the Renaissance did, so too did the cave painting prehistoric art hysteria allow us to give up our creative currency to actually be used against us to prosper a satanic agenda. Just as they have lied to us about Stonehenge and everything else under the sun, they lied to us about the cave paintings. They concocted them to fool us. As we familiarize ourselves with these great art movements that have been concocted, such as prehistoric art and the Renaissance, we must, as an ascending species, rein in our own creative currency for the purposes of evolving humanity in a positive way and stop giving away our creative currency to those who would seek to destroy us in this age of the psychopathogenesis of man. More than anything, we need to teach our children the value of their creativity by teaching them art as a stepping stone into the world of their imaginations. Put away these devices that they're using that destroys their creativity and no longer shall we be harvested for our sweat and our blood by this phylum reptilia entity. Once we know the truth, we must allow that truth to seep into us so that we can change our behavior and start evolving into the golden age that is coming soon and that we should be ready for. Thank you so much for listening and I'd really appreciate it. If you like, subscribe and hopefully comment, that would be wonderful. This particular project took me about two months to get it all together. So I know I may be slow, but it really did take a lot of uh, in-depth research. So thanks again. Bye.